welcome to the Monday, January 5th, 2009 informational meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council. Uh, we've got a lot of visitors and a lot of business going on here today, so we're going to get right down to it here. The first item on the agenda. Uh, I'd also like to note that uh, we are going to go into executive session at the end of this to, uh, to talk about a personnel issue. Uh, first item on is uh, we're going to get updates from Deborah A. Owen, City Clerk. Deborah. Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. A couple of things just to let you know. Um, a, just uh, give you an update. We were going to talk a little bit about item number 17 on the agenda, but that will actually be discussed in the fiscal committee meeting this afternoon, so I'll defer to that discussion. Um, I won't give you an update other than the red notes. But uh, mainly to talk about the Breakfast Club, if you will, we have contacted the co-chairs of the Event Center Task Force and look forward to hearing from them, uh, them on January 21st uh, at Leonardo's at 7.30 um, for the Breakfast Club. Looking forward to sharing their information with us. And then also just to let you know, the council hosts uh, this club, this meeting for the year 2009. And uh, this past year, I believe there were quarterly meetings as opposed to monthly meetings. And uh, we'd like to know at some point in time from the council whether you want us to continue on the quarterly meeting plan or should we go back to having monthly meetings uh, and just with a caveat that we always take the summer off and so we usually don't meet uh, either way uh, for the months of June, July, and August. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Questions of uh, Ms. Owen? Seeing none, very good. We're going to move on to uh, the Mayor Munson. Uh, is there anybody from the uh, Mayor's office with anything? We've got a couple issues. We'll be going with you in a few, a few minutes. So. Very good. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, number four, Audit Committee. A report from the Audit Committee. No report. No report. Very good. Fiscal Committee. Do we have any report? Uh, no report. Just uh, we will be meeting right after the uh, executive session today. Very good. Uh, Land Use Committee. No report. Very good, thank you, Mr. Jameson. Public Services Committee. No report. Very good, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, staff reports. Uh, next up, I see that we have uh, a uh, gang presentation by Officer Scott Nelson. And open discussion. Oh, I went right by open discussion here. <laughs> oh boy, uh, I, we have a uh, number uh, number eight on our council agenda is uh, open discussion for the city council. Uh, there's some issues out there, Pat. I had asked uh, Jamie if there was uh, some city-oriented uh, training for Outlook. Uh, I made it my New Year's resolution to get more uh, literate for Outlook and scheduling that I can mesh my personal and city and business life together. And she has found an individual who is willing to come in um, to uh, the council here and provide some training for us. And I'm curious if there is others who would be interested in, in joining in on that. It's a pretty reasonable amount. Uh, Jamie, was it $40 an hour or $60 for two hours or something? 65 for two hours. And the more the merrier. And I, I know it will help me to personally uh, be much more efficient. So I, I guess maybe if you're, there's an interest from somebody on the council, if you could email Jamie, and we'll just leave it at that. And if there's enough interest, we'll pursue it. Thank you, Bob. Very good. Thanks, Pat. Uh, another item that I'd like to bring up is uh, the, uh, the council. Uh, it seems that uh, every year we go through an evaluation for our clerk's office, and, uh, and uh, there was some discussion in a meeting here a while back about updating that, and I would like to know if this council is interested in forming some sort of a committee to advance the idea that... Uh, uh, the JDQ, the job uh, description, and a few other items that uh, you know we were in question about if that would be appropriate for this uh, setting here, number one, and number two, if and when we want to do it and how we'd like to do that. Uh, Councilor Jameson. Just a comment. I would say if we can get through this first process with our review, I think that might be best, and then we move on to getting into a committee to review it. But I'd like to get through this first review, if we could. It, Go ahead. It comes from you You're referring to the, the getting the JEQs finished and then evaluating where we're at with that and then decide where we want to go? Because there's, you know, the uh, Bill Tool from Human Resources has uh, indicated that he's willing to fast track the reviews of the JEQs that we provide them um, as soon as we get them, he can have the turnaround in about two weeks. I, I, I personally wouldn't mind going through that JEQ review process, and as a council, we'll have to be 
get together as a group to go through those ourselves, or at least go through them independently and then meet uh, at some time at an informational or whatever to go through it and get an agreement on it, and then turn it over to Bill and let him, you know, work his magic and come up with a, a recommendation to us. And it, as far as the timing on that, that's really going to be how fast we want to put the effort into it, because my understanding is that the JEQs are all but done. We would just need to review them. Any other thoughts on this, Gerald? Well, I, I agree with Pat. I think one of the things that we have to have is uh, current job descriptions and how those compare to what they're actually doing before we move forward. And the JEQs will tell us that. And so when those are complete, I think that's the appropriate time to go ahead and look at the next step. Very good. Any other comments or thoughts on that? I think that I, uh, I agree with the assessment here. Is there any other talk on that matter at this time? Any other, any other comments on this matter? Very good. Uh, the other thing that uh, I would like to bring up is uh, in my district on uh, 15th and uh, Garfield uh, has been some time <coughs> an issue pending uh, in the Planning Commission uh, as concerning a prayer meeting house that is uh, uh, right on it, it, what it what it is is a, a house that is going to get converted into a a mosque uh, and I say that respectfully and because I I'm, I got to admit to you that I'm not totally uh, comfortable with my descriptions of the Muslim religion because I'm woefully ignorant in a lot of respects of that so I don't mean to offend anybody by anything I might say but uh, the conversion of a house on a corner into a mosque in that neighborhood has caused some uh, uh, some of the neighbors to call me and, and come forth with some ideas and some thoughts and I know uh, that the uh, planning commission was uh, uh, their decision was uh, you know it went through the process three times and was fairly controversial and uh, uh, the reason that we are not going to uh, talk about this matter in a public forum or I mean in a formal setting uh, in the council meeting is because uh, the neighborhood uh, in spite of all the objections and questions that they had about it, nobody bothered to fill out uh, the, uh, the, where they did not like it. Uh, I guess it would be a contest. Yeah, they, nobody contested the uh, planning commission's uh, 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 you know, ruling on it. And uh, I have a neighbor down here uh, that uh, has come down here tonight to talk just a little bit about that. And uh, would you please uh, step forward and... My name is Gerald Falkert. I live at 700 South Williams here in Sioux Falls. I'm not sure what you'd like to have me go through. If I could certainly tell you what I told the Planning Commission multiple times. If that, if you'd like that, I Please. can certainly do that. Please do. And then, and then try to explain to you why we had a big misunderstanding about the proper filing that we should have done. Because we fully intended to bring this before the council. This is the first uh, presentation I gave before the Planning Commission. My name is Gerald Falkerts. I live at 700 South William Avenue, directly to the rear of the property in question. That property in question is 701 South Garfield. This is a small single family home, and it's been a single family home for the 38 years that my wife and I have lived at 700 South Williams Avenue. This would directly abut our property to the rear. We have a fence that separates it. Several months ago, and by that I mean the beginning of the summer, we became aware that this residence had been sold. Up until that point, it had not been occupied for <coughs> several years. The lady that had lived there had uh, gone into a nursing home and it remained unoccupied. We also became aware that had, it had been sold, and it, and, and it obviously had become a meeting place or an Islamic center. I learned that through talking to the people that were presently in and about the property. We, we observed construction taking place and groups of men attending what appeared to be meetings. These meetings occurred at various times of the day and night. By that I mean all hours of the day and all hours of the night. During this time, various construction continued. I, at that time, contacted the building permit people and they, were, they advised me that they had issued no building permits. I learn, learned from zoning that various conditions had been set forth uh, for the owners to meet and uh, obviously those had not been met. 
uh, they stated that they were required to get building permits and that all organized meetings at the property would have to cease until uh, they met the guidelines set forth. Uh, we further learned at that time that that wasn't the case. These meetings continued. On September 12th, I observed approximately 18 adult men depart the residence after another one of the meetings. Act activity of this nature continued and continued up to the time that we, we went before the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission instructed the applicants to conduct a neighborhood meeting. That was done. Uh, it drew a large crowd of neighbors from our neighborhood and the, uh, over, and the opposition was overwhelmingly uh, uh, in, in, a, in opposition to the plans. They presented plans to us that were quite elaborate, uh, consisting of a parking lot in the backyard, which is a small backyard that would be adjacent to our property. Uh, basically, my wife and myself opposed to this due to one due to a number of issues, mainly the parking lot. We felt that it was going to be financially prohibitive to put a parking lot into this small area. We felt that 701 South Garfield in no way was designed to be a meeting place or a mosque. It's probably a 800 square foot single family dwelling uh, and it has no uh, basement. It has been built on a slab of concrete. To change the property to a meeting place we felt would be impossible, sanitary conditions being a major issue, uh, uh, building new bathrooms and such would be nearly impossible in my opinion. To convert the small black yard to a parking lot we felt was far-fetched to say the least. Now this is what uh, we gave at the initial meeting of the Planning Commission. It subsequently was delayed. The second time it was delayed to the third time. The third time uh, uh, and after our neighborhood meeting, we discovered that new plans had been now had been submitted. These plans were totally different than what we had seen at the neighborhood meeting and were quite involved. It appeared to us that their intentions were to rebuild the property from ground up and continue on with the parking lot. At the neighborhood meeting, we were informed that the parking lot no longer was an issue with them because they did not have the funds to complete it. And they intended to park on the street and in the school parking lot, which would be Garfield Elementary. The Planning Commission on a three to two vote granted approval for conditional use <coughs> Uh, we fully intended, like I stated initially, to uh, file what, ne what was necessary to bring this before the City Commission. Due to a misunderstanding, that was not done. Okay. Questions? Questions to Gary. Uh, Councilor Knudsen. Um, thank you for being with us today. A, a couple questions is, um, I realize that this whole uh, issue has been uh, quite controversial and so forth, and I have a great respect for feelings on both sides of this issue. In um, the six and a half years I've been on the city council, I've never ever received a complaint uh, from any of the neighbors um, of the uh, present Islamic Center right across the street from Whittier uh, Middle School, nor from the Jewish Temple, which is very much built, you know, very small building built into a residential neighborhood and I always think every year I attend at least once the deli luncheon, their fundraiser, a, a wonderful event. Um, but I've just never ever uh, received any complaints from anyone in six and a half years from either of those uh, gatherings. And so um, so I, I um, you know, I worry a little bit sometimes that the unknown, you know, the fear of the unknown is sometimes a problem for us as humans. It is sometimes for me anyway, but I was just wondering, those to me are comparable examples of, of, of small, you know, uh, churches that are operating right now on a regular basis. And I just haven't, maybe there are problems that people have not brought to my attention. I, being both familiar with both of the places you've just described, I would see a big difference. The big difference is we're dealing with a very small single-family dwelling. 
The church I believe that you refer to is substantially larger than this dwelling. This is a small, single bathroom home. Uh, it's in a residential area, I grant you that. Uh, we just don't feel that that particular area uh, and the conditions that they want to put this, uh, uh, this, this church or mosque in is suitable to that area whatsoever. We have a school there. We have a high degree of traffic now. Uh, they're saying that they were, want to have at least a room for 28 men, yet they can only provide six or seven parking spots in off-street parking. Uh, that's our major objective. And I just have it. I... The uh, Islamic Center on East 6 certainly would be larger than this dwelling. This is, uh, like I said, at, at most 800 square foot. Since, since this all came about, they have gone in and rebuilt the interior of the garage. Uh, this was prior to the time the building permits were obtained, but they converted that into some type of a meeting center as well. So maybe that would give them three, 400 more square feet, I don't know. And how many parking spots right now did you say that are, um, that, that looks like from a reasonable standpoint would it exist right now? They have changed their drawings a couple times. In my opinion, if, if they do the proper setbacks and all that, if they can have seven spots, it's a small backyard. Okay. So they, if they have seven spots at the very most. Thank you. Councilor Costello. So you're, uh your concern isn't that it's a, a house of worship or anything, you just, or even that it's really next to a school. It's more just it's not big enough for what they intend to use it for. Is that right? Right. Uh, they're coming into a residential neighborhood. Yes. But, but with, with, these, with these grandioso plans that we feel probably they can't meet okay. and haven't met thus far, uh, the building that they've done thus far, in our opinion, is substandard. Uh, that would include the way the garage was reconstructed and so on. Right. I mean, uh, we, have, we have a lot of churches in residential neighborhoods, and we have, you know, certain oh, I agree with that you. have schools next to churches in residential sure. neighborhoods. So, I mean, that can't be the issue. Is, no, it's I mean, not. Is it the, the size? Is that what? It, it, we're talking about a small residential right. house of 800 square feet. They plan to turn that house into a mosque for 28 adult men. Okay. I'd like to hear from Director Cooper regarding just the, how the occupancy on a house of worship works and parking that's required and all the good stuff that go along with that. Sure. Uh, Mike Cooper, Planning and Building Services. The zoning ordinance provides for um, churches as an allowed use within a residential zoning area. The exception to that is that if the church site is not located along a collector or arterial street, they have to go through a conditional use permit process. So in this case, if the house had been located along a defined collector or arterial street, it would have been allowed without a public hearing. So we did go through the public hearing process, and as you just heard, there was quite a bit of input and discussion. And it really did focus on parking because the, the parking is one per four. So seven stalls would allow 28 people to be within the building. Um, that was one of the main things that we looked at is, is there a place for parking that would still meet the required setbacks and screening and so forth? At one time, they were trying to work out um, an arrangement with the school for more of a permanent parking, but that really wasn't. Uh, an option for them. So, um, so again, the reason that they went through the hearing was because it's not on a major street. And uh, if they do go forward, obviously they would have to comply with all of our building code requirements and, and other regulations. Um, the appeal process is one week or five days that anybody can appeal a decision by the Planning Commission to the City Council. Um, and obviously that did not happen. Uh, there is another provision in the ordinance that if um, a conditional use permit is not being conducted in conformance with the stipulations or other regulations of the city, 
that uh, there is the option of bringing that back to the Planning Commission and City Council for consideration. Councilor Costello. So, um, so they, they will have to have an occupancy load of 28, or they will get an occupancy load of 28? That's what they're, yes, they're that's what they had for. requested in their conditional use, and as I understand it. And they'll have to provide off-street parking for seven vehicles? Yes. And is that realistic on the property? Yes, based on the plans that we reviewed, that is realistic. And so we'll fast forward six months or whatever, and, and um, they go through and they do it, and they're on a regular basis have 40 people in there, and they never got the seven parking spaces on there. We we cancel the conditional use permit. Is that we could bring it back for another review process. And, and if that were bore out, then we could just cancel the conditional use permit. And they wouldn't be able to use it as a moss. That would be a worst case situation. Yes. Or you could modify the conditional use with other stipulations. We've done that before too, such as up on North Cliff with the car lot. Councillor Anderson and Councillor Jameson. Okay, Mike, can you give us a little history on this? Um, this went to the Planning Commission three different times? Yes. And what happened on the first two with the votes? Were they 3-2, 4-1? There was just deferrals. Just deferrals? For additional public input and additional information. The only vote was taken on the, at the third meeting. Okay. With the uh, amount of neighborhood resistance that uh, happened in the first meeting or so what what ha what changed from that point on you just no longer had contact with the residents or well the, the the proposed or the applicant was encouraged to continue to work with the neighborhood and meet with them to look at options such as the parking how that could be addressed um, to deal with some of the concerns and obviously when it came to the final hearing it was a split vote I mean it was not unanimous but now, does this change the zoning of that property also? No, no, no it's it just stays they can, residential? Yes. Uh, Councilor Jameson. Thanks, Mike. How are mm -hmm. you doing? I'm doing well. Okay. Happy New Year. Thanks for addressing this issue for us. I've gotten a couple calls on this myself. Just on the idea of the uh, failure to comply with the conditional use permit, who actually would be monitoring that? I mean, if they don't put the parking spots in, that's pretty easy for everybody to see, but if they've got 100 people showing up there and filling up the place, how would you ever use that information or how would that information be verified? How would you, I guess I'm, I'm thinking that these people are looking for their options. Right. If you uh, could help us. It could be done one of two ways, either through a complaint basis by a property owner in the area and then we also do a one-year monitoring. We don't typically go in um, every month or every six months unless it's a stipulation for a conditional use, but we do a one-year review to make sure that it is in compliance. And then we also um, look at the record to see if there have been any issues with complaints or other input about the use. So we Co do that for all conditional uses. Councillor Knudsen and then Councillor Staggers. Um, Director Cooper, I was wondering, I mean, I realize what the ordinance is, and it's, it's so uh, uh, good that you can just kind of review that with us today, the whole process and so forth. And I was so, I mean, I know what the ordinance is and, um, and the process as far as the Planning Commission. I was wondering, in light of the controversy, I mean, has, is, there any, um, is there any room for compromise with with the two sides on this, or is all the compromising that's possible been done? I th guess I'm thinking about New Year and being an optimist here. I think the, you know, based on the, the amount of time that we went through to review this process and to come up with a recommendation by the Planning Commission, that probably everything that was, was to be discussed got discussed back and forth. Um, it, I think it really came down to the Planning Commission on what legal grounds did they have to deny this use. If it met the requirements of the city ordinances, then what grounds would you have to deny it? Are you Councilor Steggers? Yes, Mike, is 15th Street a collector street? 
No. It's not, okay. Otherwise, they would not have had to go through the hearing. But they're facing, I mean, it's... They're facing Garfield. Garfield, yeah. okay. But if it was a collector street, uh, yeah. they would not have had to gone through this process. That's correct. Okay. Also, too, in ordinance, is there, do we have something in ordinance about this checking after one year for compliance? I guess I didn't recall that. That's just a, a standard policy that we have. Um, is that enforced every time? Uh, because I, I don't really remember except for when the city council said, hey, we want you to look at this for three months or six or a year or whatever. Yep. So no, it's we, just a policy you yep, have. We've been doing that for a number of years. Okay. Anything else of uh, Mr. Cooper? Very good, thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, thank you. I have uh, one more gentleman from the neighborhood who'd like to come down here and give some testimony. Of. I'd like to. Thank you for having me this afternoon. My name is Jeff Hayes. Actually, I grew up over by Meldrum Park, where the current Islamic Center is, and uh, I am concerned about the new mosque at 15th and Garfield, and I've become concerned about that just recently because I drove through the neighborhood, my old neighborhood, over on East 6th Street. I realized that the planning board gave the conditional use permit, but I'd like to have you uh, uh, think that over again. It, this uh, house is not on a collector street. Uh, it is in a residential area, and uh, you know that they're going to have to blacktop the backyard with seven spark parking spaces, where it will total a 28 uh, a 28 people in the the new mosque over on uh, Garfield. I'm interested, and I believe that the planning uh, committee doesn't know this. I went down to zoning. And if you're familiar with City Hall, uh, their office downstairs in the basement, zoning's on one side, inspectors on the other. And uh, after I drove through the neighborhood over on East 6th Street on a Friday afternoon in my old neighborhood, I realized that there were just dozens and dozens and dozens of cars parked on those streets. Not only 6th Street, but on Jessica, on Lewis, on 7th. There's probably a, a hundred extra cars in that area. And I've been in the church business for a number of years and actually kind of representing uh, Jeannie Sarda, who's a neighbor over in the Garfield area. And I drove through this area, and like I said, I've been in the church business for many years, and I thought, how does this house of worship get away with all these cars uh, not parked in their own property? Because we've been told for many years in, in our church, the chief zoning officer came to our church for a number of years, and she would always say to us, if you enlarge this church, you're going to have to enlarge the parking lot, uh, one space for every four people. And uh, so I looked and I thought, this can't be happening here on East 6th Street. And so I went down to zoning. And uh, they pulled out the records, and the records are being passed around. And you can see that the document was signed. And at the bottom of the document for the East 6th Street property, it says that there can only be 20 people in that neighborhood, in that building, in that neighborhood. And so I went over there the first Friday of December and uh, took some pictures of the traffic. And I gave you a DVD of the traffic over there, the parking over there. Um, and so you can take a look at that. Well, then I'm standing at zoning, and uh, the inspectors are, of course, right on the same desk, only on the other side. And the zoning people are saying, that's right, only 20 people can be in that building on East 6th Street. But it's posted as the load over on East 6th Street that they can have 120 people in that building. And to go to the Garfield property, I don't even know if the planning uh, people knew this. I talked to a couple of the commissioners and they said, we didn't know that. We wouldn't have uh, passed it most likely if we would have known this. But it's going to be licensed or zoned for <coughs> 28 people over on Garfield because there's gonna be seven parking spots for people per parking spot. But as I stood there, an inspector named Gary Dean, I got his name, Gary Dean, he said and told zoning, he told zoning, that the load over on Garfield was not going to be 28, but it was going to be 125. And so I would think that the neighbors would have a problem with that, and I would hope that the city would have a problem with that too. I feel 
that uh, a lot of the churches around town, of course, have built huge parking lots to accommodate their congregations. And that's what I think should happen with this uh, church body. They should do the same thing, or they should find another location to locate this house of worship. That's what the Baptists do. That's what the Methodists do. That's what the Assembly of God do. They find a place which is zoned properly for their house of worship. I believe that no other church would be given such a provision. And like I said, I've been a resident of Sioux Falls for 55 years. Today's my birthday, and I've been in the church business for 30 years, and I've never seen it happen. And so I think this is highly unusual. Also, while I was over on East 6th Street on the Islamic Center, at the Islamic Center, and of course these people are the same people that are guiding the uh, property on Garfield, I believe that there's a correlation between both properties. What is the history of the folks on East 6th Street? They agreed to only have 20 people in their building, but um, the papers, the folks at Kello, KSFY, KDLT, reported that there were 50 men that stood across the street at Meldrum Park last Friday afternoon. And I have provided a DVD clip of that because I was over there. I was just taking pictures of the traffic and all the, the demonstration arose. And so these people came out of this, this house of worship along with not only the 50 men, but women and children. And there was probably 120, 130 people there. And so I think the pictures that I have uh, are proof enough that there's more than 20 people in that building. And uh, I believe that uh, just even the conduct of what happened last Friday, and I'm in the midst of the, middle, uh, midst of the demonstration, so I take some pictures. And they wanted me to take some pictures because they wanted, of course, the news to get out about what's happening in Gaza. And uh, once again, I don't think we as a church could come out of our building, hold up protest signs across the street, and advertised for the KKK. And this group came out of their church, picked up signs readily, went across the street, and actually they were supporting the government in Gaza, which is Hamas, a terrorist organization. So I have a problem with that. And I guess my question is, will the same thing happen over on Garfield, where it's a quiet residential neighborhood? And from the track record of what I saw with my eyes and what you have as pictures and DVDs, I could say that that could happen again over on Garfield. Questions? Councilor Staggers. Yeah, I, I was just uh, uh, interested in uh, the First Amendment to our Constitution. Uh, how do you justify uh, what you would prefer to have happen with the First Amendment? As far as free speech? Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, focusing on the free exercise part of the First Amendment. Well, I believe that... Uh, this is something, I mean, if I understand, that this is uh, property that they have bought. Mm -hmm. So it it's, belongs to this Islamic center or Islamic group. Mm -hmm. It's their property. And how do you reconcile this with the First Amendment well, and free do, exercise? Well, of course, we do have zoning regulations in Sioux Falls. And so churches are limited to do certain things. We just don't uh, live in a zoneless society here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I believe that uh, uh, the folks down at the House of Worship over on East 6th Street should have also complied with a permit for having a demonstration or a port protest. And Lieutenant Miller down at the Sioux Falls Police Department says that there's none on file. Um, churches here in Sioux Falls, um, every time there's a day of prayer or a gathering, if it be at the courthouse or wherever, we receive a permit where we can gather together. And so the First Amendment that you're citing, Commissioner Snaggers, doesn't give us a willy-nilly approach, and we as church people do anything we want to. Would you want me to go to all the churches that have spent great amounts of money in buying houses, tearing them down, uh, paving lots. You want me to tell them that, look, there's a church in town that just bought a residential property and they got a conditional use permit to blacktop the backyard. And good, you know, that sounds like a good idea to me. 
would you give me the same permit in a residential area to do the same thing? I guess I'd say in reply, the First Amendment supersedes a lot of these things that are done at state and local level. I mean, that's our primary focus should be is on the First Amendment. Well, and, and, and talking and, to yes. a lawyer in Virginia this morning, they said that churches and mosques and synagogues need to be treated equally in a community. And I question if we're being treated equally. When I drove down 6th Street over in my old neighborhood and saw all these cars all over the place and saw later, last Friday, dozens of people coming out of this church building, I thought, wait a minute, why have we been complying with the zoning ordinance for close to 40 years in our church? if these folks can get away with this and are not held accountable. This morning I went down to zoning with my pictures and DVDs and I said, you know what? Somebody needs to complain about this because this isn't right. Mr. Cooper, could you please address the uh, permit for assembly question that we seem to be having? Uh, is, is it necessary to have a permit? Oh. I'll, I'll kind of tackle two or three issues here. Um, pertaining to the property on East 6th Street, that goes back to when that was a clubhouse actually for the JCs years and years ago. And so that building has been used for assembly for a number of years. There was never a conditional use permit required uh, for the change of use of that property. Um, and in that case, in talking to the staff just this afternoon, there is a um, a standard that the building services department uses per square feet of building area uh, of occupants versus what zoning uses for the number of required off-street parking. But there was never a conditional use for that site and there was never any requirements of the maximum number of people. But we are going to look at that just to make sure that there isn't any violations uh, of the current use. On the Garfield site, it was, at least from my understanding, very clear that the intent was to max, uh, have a, the maximum number of people of 28. And again, I'm gonna be talking to the staff because if that's not the case, um, that's, that's what our understanding was. Um, and then the assembly, the ordinance requires that for 10 or more people, you have to get a permit for an assembly in the sidewalk or street or park area. I think that's for downtown, isn't it? The downtown. Then for the outside of the downtown, what is it, 20 or so? Chief. <laughs> Chief, please. Doug Bartell, please, Chief. Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, I'm not aware of any, any boundaries on where the permits are. Or if, if you have 10 or more, you need to have a, uh, an assembly permit. and. Obviously, I think in this case probably wouldn't have mattered because it used to be 25 and it was switched to 10, but it sounds like they had way more than 25 to, yeah, uh, to conduct any sort of a lawful assembly. My, my understanding when we dealt with the cruising, you know, downtown and, and those kind of issues that we spe specified that in the downtown area, it was, if you had 10 or more people, you had to have a permit mm -hmm. just for the downtown area. And then outside the downtown, uh, my understanding was 25 or 20, something like that. Can I? Councilor Costello. If I might, I mean, permit issue is a completely separate issue. I think what the concern here is the, the use of the property. And I would have two comments. One, I'd like to somebody to explain what the difference between the 28 and the 20 number is that's on this application. It's the 6th Street, 28 for 15th and Garfield. Okay. And then, you know, the comment about the uh, Councilor Staggers was bringing, and, and you were talking that um, they need to go through permitting and that. Well, they did, and the neighborhood didn't protest it, and they had five or so many days to do that, and the neighborhood didn't do that. So what, what now do you want the city to do? What, what specifically are you asking us to do? Sure. Please, please, come, please come forward. <coughs> I 
I think the city should revisit this issue actually as far as the Garfield property and also I think the city should be uh, keeping an eye on the East 6th Street property. As I passed out that document, uh, it does say 20 people on the bottom of there. I don't know how we can argue with that. Uh, there's, there's five parking spaces, and zoning says per space you have four people, and so there should be 20 people in that property, and that's what the document says. Um, as far as, in, explain it to me, I've asked zoning and inspection and the fire department inspector, why is it that two or three departments within the city government vary on the number of people that you can have in a building? And I would believe that, uh, you know what I'm talking about, over on East 6th Street, um, the zoning says there's 20 people in there, but uh, the load limit in there is like 120 people, and that's what's posted. And furthermore, over on East, East uh, West, uh, the Garfield, 15th and Garfield property, current situation, the neighbors believe, the planning board people believe, I've talked to two of them, and they said, we based our decision on 28 people being in that building, whereas I talked to Gary Dean at an inspection, as well as uh, Perry Volden, the, the fire inspector, he said, well, we would agree with inspection and Gary Dean said, we're going to put up a sign that says there are going to be 125 people in this building, a small residential house with only seven parking spots out behind. I have a problem with that. Councilor Jameson. I think I heard uh, Mike Cooper mention that he was going to review the, what's actually happening at the other location. And I think it'd be best for us if we got that information. I, I agree with that. And then I'd like uh, this council to know that uh, the mayor, Kenny Anderson, and myself did uh, attend the groundbreaking for the new Islamic Center over by Axdale Park, and we were excited to be there. And uh, we wish the best for the Muslim community, uh, as well as the neighborhoods that uh, they're entering into. And uh, I'd like to put this off until Mr. Cooper uh, provides, uh, provides some more information to us. And uh, Councilor Anderson, could I count on your assistance here to kind of monitor this situation? and? Uh, all right, and we'd like to thank you and yeah. Gary for coming down here tonight, and uh, we'll be in touch, okay? And I would like to say in my closing statement that, uh, you know, if this was a Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist church, I just believe that all churches should be treated equally in the city of Sioux Falls. So thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Chair, can I? Yes, sir, Mr. Stagg. I guess I'm a little concerned about... Mike uh, Cooper saying that, well, we're going to go over on East 6th Street now and, and look around to see if they're just violating something. Well, I, evidently, they've been grandfathered. The situation good. just got grandfathered in there, and I don't think anybody's examined it. And if it, if it, exa it merits examination, it does. And if there's nothing to worry about, I wouldn't worry well, about I, that. Well, I, I, you know, we could do that to anybody in town. Certainly could. Yeah, and, and this is, I don't think, a good precedent that could possibly be established. They haven't. To our knowledge, they haven't done anything wrong, so why are we doing this? Anybody else? Mr. Jameson? No, I say we just move along here. Very good. Very good. Uh, next up, then, uh, is there anything else for uh, open discussion for the City Council? Seeing none, then we will move to uh, presentation A, which is a gang presentation. Today we have Officer Scott Nelson and Officer Cullen McClure. Do you think this is good? Go see what you know. Keep this very brief. My name is Scott Nelson. This is my partner, Cullen McClure. Uh, we're two of four officers that are assigned to the Street Crimes Unit here in Sioux Falls. Uh, we were created uh, in April of 2007 basically to combat the increasing gang problem, uh, particularly in the Pettigrew Heights neighborhood. Um, since then, we've, I think, made a considerable impact. Uh, our, our main responsibilities 
uh, with the gangs. So first and foremost are IDing who these people are, where they live, what they're up to, uh, that kind of thing. And our second major responsibility is enforcement. Uh, we are an enforcement unit. Uh, we have a zero tolerance policy uh, in that neighborhood because of the problems that uh, these young men and women have been causing for a number of years. If someone's doing something wrong over there, they get a ticket or they go to jail. That's usually as simple as that. Uh, and it seems to be working. Uh, just some facts really quick about uh, the, some of the successes that we've had in the last couple of years. Uh, since April of 2007, we've identified approximately 275 gang members and or associates living here in Sioux Falls. Uh, those 275 members are broken down into about 25 different gangs. I know some people find that hard to believe, but we've got, you know, just like the bigger cities, we've got gangs in Sioux Falls such as Bloods and Crips, uh, Latin Kings and Queens, uh, White Fence from Los Angeles, uh, Vice Lords from the Chicago area, MS-13. Uh, we've got prison gangs here. We've got outlaw motorcycle gangs. Essentially, we have it all. Uh, the two gangs that give us the most trouble on a day-to-day -day basis by far are the Gangster Disciples, which are a Chicago-based gang, and the Sereno uh, 13 gang, which is a uh, gang from Southern California. Uh, essentially, Sereno means Southerner. Uh, these are just a few slides of some of the people that we deal with out on the street. Uh, this gentleman up here is a member of Darkside family. Uh, he was a penitentiary inmate as of about six months ago. He actually killed a guy uh, when he was 16 years old, approximately 10 years ago. He's now back out on the street. Uh, Darkside family is primarily a North Rapid City gang, uh, but we do have a handful of them here. Uh, these pictures here are a little bit gory, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but simply trying to make a point. This incident here happened uh, back in November where some gangster disciple gang members waiting inside a house for this gentleman uh, to get home jumped him and burned that, uh, what, what that is a three-point uh, pitchfork essentially burned in the back of his, his right shoulder. Uh, essentially the points on the pitchfork mean money, mackin, and murder. And the point I'm trying to make is that that's how these people think. Uh, some of the activities obviously that our gang members in Sioux Falls are up to. Uh, primarily, it's drug dealing. No question about it, more and more, especially when it comes to uh, our gang members that come here from the Chicago area and Southern California. We're seeing a big influx in the Hispanic population, obviously, with the economy being pretty sour you know, everywhere else and us being relatively stable here in Sioux Falls. We're getting more and more of these people coming here. Uh, unfortunately, a handful of them aren't very nice people and they bring the drug trade with them. So we're seeing more and more of the methamphetamine and those kind of drugs coming up from Mexico and a lot of these people are Hispanic gang members. Uh, community impact, uh, last year uh, we took approximately 1,800 calls for service. Uh, we made over 300 arrests and that doesn't even include warrants. We made hundreds of warrant arrests. Uh, issued approximately 1,000 citations. And most of our activity is targeting gang members. I mean, people don't believe that they're out there, but believe every day we're dealing with these people. And they're, you know, we don't have a major problem yet, but more and more they're going to become an issue for us to deal with over the next several years. So I wanted to keep this brief for you guys give it, have a chance to ask any questions that you might have that hopefully I can answer for you or my partner can answer. Councillor Brown. How young of an age are you seeing these? Are they in the high schools as well? Oh, absolutely. They're anywhere from 8, 9, and 10-year-olds all the way up to the, the mid-30s. Um, your guys that are coming in from out of state, bigger cities like California, uh, Atlanta, places like that that are bringing the, the loads of, of dope with them are generally a little bit older, you know, mid-20s, early 20s to, to early 30s. Uh, a lot of your issues with the, the graffiti, uh, the thefts, the car hoppings, and stuff like that. A lot of that's done typically by your younger gang members trying to, you know, earn their stripes and, and get the respect from the older members. Um, some of you may live in, you know, not too far from downtown, and every summer we have at least a couple of hundred uh, gang-specific gra graffitis that we have to deal with. It slows down this time of year, you know, A, because of the weather, and B, because these kids are in school, but, you know, they have the whole school year to think about what they're going to do, and usually beginning of summer it starts right back up again, so... So are the school resource officers involved? In, in Absolutely they are. Uh, they deal with a lot of it during the school year. Some schools more than others. 
I mean, obviously, because of the proximity to the certain neighborhoods. Axtell Park, for example, has a lot of young kids over there that are in gangs. Uh, Lincoln High School probably has more gang members there than the other high schools do. Councilor Anderson? Um, in aspect to the Hispanic gangs that are moving in here, and it was stated that they're moving into the Woodier area, is that correct? Correct. We've got, I mean, several houses over there right now that we, we know they're dealing drugs out of, and we're working on getting some cases built on those. So, What other uh, steps are you taking, like community involvement, uh, maybe talking to the church leaders in the area or Hispanic leaders to assist? Uh, we do what we can there. I would like to do more, and we should do more. Obviously, there's time constraints, uh, you know, on top of our or responsibilities of going out and, and talking to these people and stopping them and you know taking their pictures and that kind of thing we have to answer 911 calls too so and a lot of times you know that you know, quite frankly that's a priority so we have to you know deal with that first but you're absolutely right we need to do no, do more on that end thank you uh, Councilor Steggers yes uh, <clears throat> you mentioned I believe we have 275 gang members and associates yes how many hardcore gang members do we actually have? Well, the way, the way we document a gang member, okay. we follow basically the state law of South Dakota. Okay. We have criteria that people have to meet, and there's several of those. It can be anything from uh, how you're dressed, are you wearing gang-specific clothing, uh, do you have gang-specific tattoos, and are you hanging out with another gang member? And just huh. to give you an example, say, say we stop a, a young man uh, for a traffic violation, okay, and he's wearing obvious gang uh, clothing like a blue uh, jersey that has the number 13 on it and he happens to be a Hispanic male well chances are he's a Serrano gang member the number 13 means the letter M it's, you know it's not obvious to everybody but everything has meaning numbers have meaning letters have meaning uh, and say he's with another person that is essentially dressed the same that's enough for us to document that guy as a confirmed gang member in the state of South Dakota now that number 275 I said gang members and or associates. Mm -hmm. The hardcore confirmed gang members is probably more in the 200 range, give, give or take a few. Uh, okay. But you know, if they're hanging out with other gang members, they probably are too. We may not have confirmed them because we didn't have enough to meet the uh, criteria on that particular day. But if you stop that same person the next day, maybe now they're, they're wearing the colors or maybe now they have a fresh tattoo. So it changes, it's, very, it's a very fluid number. It could, you know, next year it could be 300. Next year it could be smaller. You just don't know. It's always changing. So, are we trying to infiltrate them? <laughs> no. no. Okay. Councilor Knudsen. Uh, have we had any positive experiences as far as um, gang members who have um, decided they are very tired of that kind of a lifestyle uh, and and just, you know, contacted you because they want to get out of that way of life and, and uh, I improve their, their lives for the future? Well, we, we've had gang members who have approached us or we've talked to that, that have told us they want to get out of the lifestyle and they would like to help the younger kids. Um, usually they say that when they're being charged with something to help themselves out and uh, not once have we ever had one actually come back and fulfill the promise. It's, it's usually uh, you know, trying to save their own skin kind of thing, but they've never fulfilled that promise in the end. Between my house and downtown, I live over on by 12th and Granger. I ride my bike frequently uh, Friday, Saturday nights, you know, uh, heading towards downtown, and so I've, I've had an opportunity to see quite a bit of what you're talking about, especially the graffiti in the summertime. A spray can doesn't work very well in the winter, uh, but uh, you know, one thing that, that occurs to me is that there seems to be uh, a large amount of Native American uh, gang members, and I don't know if they're <coughs> the gangs around the reservation, and, and, and if, if that's so, how do they, do they interact with the other, uh, let's say the Spanish American gangs that would be out there? There, there is a a large population of Native American uh, gang members, specifically in, in the Gangster Disciples here in Sioux Falls. Um, and right now, uh, we don't see a big interaction between them and, and the Hispanic gang, say the Serenos. Um, but the Serenos just seem to be, they're just now moving in. We've seen a, a big influx in the last year um, in the Whittier Park neighborhood. And to keep them at a minimum will, will, be, will help us to keep them from interacting because sooner or later they will interact and it will probably be in a bad way because each one's going to be 
wanting their own turf or they're selling drugs or doing what they do and they, they want to control their own section of the city. So then that's our, our primary goal is to kind of keep their numbers to a minimum and their activity so they don't have that interaction. We don't have those problems. Councilor Costello. Does there seem to be a, an age range that it, the primary or 275 are in? Is it, at one time it was my understanding that, you know, they, they in essence maybe grow out of being in a gang or either get arrested and they can't or, or grow out of it. Is it, is it, to, is it that 15 to 25? Does it go up to 30 by the time they're 40? Are they pretty much done with it? I'd or? say our most active members would be the 15 to 25 year range. Um, the ones who are active out on the street all the time, you see hanging out, uh, doing the car hoppings and the burglaries and things like that. Uh, usually the older members, like you said, are either arrested or they found somewhere else to live. Uh, they're in jail. Um, sometimes the older members are the ones who are the ones who are actually running the show. You don't see them anymore because they're in charge. They don't have to be the ones out on the street getting in trouble. Um, those, those are the guys that we don't see and they don't cause the, the problems that the community sees, but they're the ones who are ultimately the, the biggest problem. Can they get out of gangs if they wanted to? There's always, there's always ways for people to get out of gangs, and, and several of them have very strict rules. The gangs, they have the, the guidelines. Uh, a lot of them have, if you're going to get out there, they will beat you out. Or if you just leave the gang, some of them have rules that, that you can get killed. Uh, but for the most part, when these guys get out of gangs, it's because they, they've either they moved to a city where they don't know anybody and really did get tired of it, or they went to prison, or, or something worse happened to them. Councilor Jamison and then Councilor Brown. Just a quick thanks for, get, for, for what you guys do. Just a quick question for the police chief, though, if I could. Doug, do you see any... Uh, room for improvement or is there some place you need more help to keep fighting this fight well actually I'm very satisfied with the direction that we've been going with the street crimes unit I, I think you can see uh, a marked difference in particularly in the uh, Pettigrew Heights area uh, these officers along with the other two officers that are part of their unit have, uh, have had a, a definite impact on on this problem in our city and um, you know, we, we aren't burying our heads in the sand and saying that we don't have gangs and that they aren't a, a big issue here. Uh, but, you know, what we have here doesn't hold the candle to what some of the other cities have. I think oftentimes we think of gangs, we think of, you know, large numbers of, of these uh, groups standing out on the street corner, taking over neighborhoods, that sort of thing. And uh, we certainly haven't seen that here. Uh, I'm very comfortable with the... Uh, with the approach that we're taking with that and you know we actually I know we've talked about it at budget time how we're uh, adjusting our our shift hours matter of fact that takes a effect next Monday and uh, I'm hopeful through that that we're going to be able along with the uh, new officers that we've just added uh, uh, that we'll be able to uh, address some of these problems even more but uh, yeah I when we started this out it was a pilot project uh, we we're you know uh, it was actually an idea of, of some of these officers that are, are involved in the unit today. And, uh, and I decided that we would let them run with it and let's give it a shot. And it was kind of a six-month thing and see how it goes. And, and if it didn't prove itself, we'd get rid of it. But uh, I'll be the first to admit that I've been very impressed and, and satisfied with what they've done. So we're definitely going to continue it. Great. Thanks. Chief, you're looking pretty sharp tonight. Councilor Brown? <laughs> Chief, uh, also, you, you've shown us the, the city piece of prevention, but what is the school district doing to prevent gangs? Well, yeah, and they, and they touched on that just briefly. Uh, you know, we've got the 11 SROs that are in all the schools, and they're very active in this, and the, and the school district is, is very supportive of our efforts as well. And, you know, a lot of this is an education thing and, and, and not letting it get out of hand. And, and part of what they do is by identifying these groups, they know that we know who they are and... and uh, basically that they're, they're now on our radar. And, and the officers in the schools are, do a very good job of that. And, and they, ha again, have the zero tolerance in the schools. The district has always had that with, with the wearing of the colors and the different gang signs and all of those sort of things, just uh, to totally eliminate that from the, uh, the school atmosphere. So having the officers in the school in addition to this, it just goes hand in hand. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming down tonight. It's very informative. Thanks for the work that you do. Uh, part B of our, uh, our presentations is going to be the month monthly financial update with Eugene Rohnhorst. <coughs> and uh, today, 
Uh, we have our legal counsel that's going to be present to answer some questions regarding the city council agenda item 25, the sales tax revenue box. Gene. Gene Roanhorse, Director of Finance. Um, first on the financial statements, in the interest of time, I'm going to just uh, basically see if there's any real questions on it. There's really nothing new to report on the financial statements. I can't even report sales tax to you this time because uh, at year end, the first check in January rolls back into 08. So I, we can't even give you a, a decent number for what, the, what uh, it looks like. Um, based on what we've seen, we're probably going to come in in that 2 to 3% growth rate range for the sales tax, and that's down from the 6.5% that we had in the plan. Uh, so uh, that's our best estimate at this point, but we'll, we'll wait and see. That check comes from the state somewhere around the 15th to the 20th of the month. Uh, that's when we'll see it. Uh, the other year-end stuff that we've been doing, we're obviously uh, trying to close down everything, make sure we have a clean cutoff uh, for the year. It seems to be going well. Uh, it appears that uh, the snow removal hasn't done uh, any really nasty damage to our numbers. Uh, so we're, it's looking like we're going to have, uh, uh, well, we will have a surplus. The, the question is just how much. I don't want to put a number on that at this point, but uh, it's, it's, it will be uh, or it will be fine for the year right now. It's just a matter of how good it will be. So unless someone has some specific questions about the financial statements, you should have gotten those about a week ago or maybe more. Um, Costello. Gene, are we... Maybe it's too early to tell, but are we going to end positive for the year then as far as uh, uh, putting money into the reserves instead of taking money out? Or Yes, we'll be putting money into the reserves, and we're reasonably sure that our ratio is going to climb. Okay. So uh, we still have that sticky wicket hanging out there. Get them that way. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, then what we'd like to do, uh, we have with us uh, the, tonight the, uh, uh, the team that really has been working on the uh, flood control bonds and uh, getting those issued, and tonight you'll be considering a second reading of that bond issue. We're going to do this and kind of let, let each member of the team actually uh, come up and take care of the, or cover a certain area. First, we're going to have Mike Cooper come up, and he, uh, he'll talk about uh, the issue, that is the floodplain, number of places involved, uh, number of people, uh, the uh, cost of insurance, of, of uh, flood insurance, things of that nature, and really define the problem. Uh, Mark Cotter will then come up and uh, give, us, give some information on the solution to the problem, which is the raising of the levees and uh, of the bridge or reconstruction of the bridge. Those are the two things that uh, are involved, and Mark will walk through a little bit of the construction timing in that. Uh, then we're going to have Jessica Cameron uh, from PFM. She is our uh, financial consultant on this transaction. Uh, she will come up and uh, give you a real brief uh, scenario. Uh, you've all seen, we've met with everyone, almost everyone uh, personally on uh, the structure that we we're looking at, I want to be very careful to say that what you see is the structure is not locked in stone. I can guarantee you it will change. The only question is how much it will change. We will have more data, more information uh, by the uh, middle of February, end of February, that uh, when we have to have things locked down and, and, and a lot can change. You've got this uh, uh, stimulus that's coming through from uh, the new administration and that, and that's going to have some impact on things. And then finally, we'll have Betsy Abbey. Uh, I think you all know Betsy. She's uh, our bond counsel. Um, she uh, does most of our bond work, uh, at least of this nature. She's with Lindquist and Venom out of Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, by the way, we have one other uh, member from Minnesota. That's uh, Jessica. She's also from Minnesota. Uh, the way we, uh, we have these uh, consultants to uh, help us, and, and what Betsy will do is actually walk you through the uh, through the bond ordinance as far as what uh, what it means and, and uh, any questions that you might have about the bond ordinance. So with that, uh, Mike, uh, we can start with you. I'm going to give my begin my comments with a little story that um, 
I was reading through some of the history of Sioux Falls, which um, is very interesting. You should try it sometime. But back in 1955, um, the city had gone through a number of years of significant flood events. And that year, there was a group of business people and city leaders that got together to devise a plan that could be used to prevent future flood events from occurring, um, which involved a flood control project. And that plan um, never went anywhere because there was no funding for it. And in 1957, there was a huge flood event that had a significant impact on quite a bit of the city at that time. And that's actually what led to the following year when the Corps of Engineers came in to begin the construction of our flood control project that was done in 1960. Um, after 1960, we thought we had protection for what they called the 100-year flood. But since that time, with additional, additional hydrological data, um, <laughs> the Corps of Engineers began discussions with the city that, that we should look at making additional improvements uh, around the city to our flood protection system. And I was just asking Tom Berkland how many years we've been working with the Corps on this. It's been over 20 years that we've been talking about doing this project with them. And as you know, when we went to the CIP, uh, we identified a project to complete the balance of the flood control project, including replacement of the 41st Street Bridge. And all this was being precipitated by uh, recent meetings that we had with FEMA last year about changing the boundaries of our flood control uh, or our flood impact area. Um, the meetings that we've been having with FEMA and with the public um, shows that based on the best information that we have right now, that the additional area that potentially would be impacted by the new flood maps without the completion of the project will impact um, about three quarters of a billion dollars worth of land and buildings around the city. Three quarters of a billion. <coughs> and of that, about 582 million is the structural valuation. The rest of it is land. The, uh, the number of structures just the area between Russell Street and I-229, which is going to be the most significantly impacted with the new maps, there's about 1,300 structures within that area alone that would be impacted by the new maps. If you go around the entire city, it's probably around 2,000 structures. And we're still trying to sort out a specific estimate at this time, but those are numbers that, that for purposes of discussion, we are looking at. Of the 2,000, about 1,300 are residential, and the balance are non-residential. So it's a huge impact on our community if we don't move forward with this project. Uh, in terms of flood insurance, the meetings that we've been having with the public and with FEMA, you know, everybody wants to know how much is it going to cost me for flood insurance, and should I buy flood insurance? Um, it's hard for us to give everybody a specific number, especially for the non-residential properties, because there's different formulas involved in the insurance <laughs> rates. But for residential properties, we've been using a, a rule of thumb that for every $100,000 worth of building, you're going to pay about $1,000 worth of insurance premiums. So if we just take um, take the total valuation of buildings that would be impacted by the new floodplain maps of $582 million and divide that by 100,000, that's $5.8 million potentially of new insurance premiums that could be paid in one year. That's per year of $5.8 million. And again, that's assuming that we don't um, have the project completed and that we would have to adopt the new maps. So obviously it's a major concern to all the people that we've been talking to through the public hearings and within our office. 
um, not only the residential property owners, but also the commercial property owners. Um, that area, the, the meadows on the river, the Empire Mall, uh, imagine how those properties would be impacted if we had a major flood event. So the message that we're getting is let's try to get this project done as quickly as we can so that we can potentially reduce the time that people might have to buy insurance. Plus, if we are able to make a commitment to move forward with this project soon, uh, we're still negotiating with FEMA on when these new maps might take effect. And uh, I think we want to make sure that FEMA knows that we are serious about moving ahead with this project so that A, it's going to reduce the time that people would be impacted with the insurance rates, um, and B, it may even give us some leverage if we have an assurance to FEMA that we are going to fund this project, that we may be able to negotiate with them on when the new maps might become effective. So for both of those reasons, um, obviously we think it's imperative that we do move forward with this flood control project, including the bridge. So again, I don't have a specific, uh, I don't have a 100% accurate estimate on how much insurance every property is going to pay. Um, it's really not within our ability to make that determination, but the best estimate that we could come up with was that $5.8 million, which is huge. Um, and we've told every property owner that's within the new mapping boundary that they need to go talk to their um, financial institution to get a better determination on what exactly they may have to pay. So that's a real quick overview of as far as the floodplain portion of this uh, project that we're talking about. Counselor, Any questions for me? Councilor Jameson. Mike, I was just writing some of your numbers down. The 582 million, what was that? That's the valuation of the buildings okay. that would be impacted with the new maps that are not currently being impacted. Okay, and then just one other question. The uh, tactic of negotiating with FEMA still on kind of backing off on enforcing these new maps, is there anything else that we can do to help in that negotiations? I mean, is you can you can approve the funding for the project. I think. Okay, but how about to be honest with you? How about in your communications with those guys? I mean, are, and I know it's the mayors probably. You and you guys have all been doing this, but what about like our senators and? We've been in touch with our congressional delegation, so yep. we're trying to work through all those channels to find out for sure what our options are. So we're yep. still having those discussions. Okay, so you got everybody leaning on them. Yeah. Hard. Yep. I mean, I think that's only fair. That I'm just speaking out loud here, but it seems only fair that those guys should back off a little bit if if uh, they want to enforce this new map on everybody that and just come out of the blue and tell mm -hmm. us about it. They should give us a little time to. But at the same of, time, I don't want to end up repeating history from 1955 that all of a sudden we don't do a project and there's a major flood event. So. Well, I would be the first one to say that we absolutely need to do this. I just would think that it only seems fair and reasonable that those guys give us a little time to react after they tell us we've got new maps coming, that they give us some time to, you know, to prepare for it. So yeah. hopefully you guys get somewhere with that. I think yep. that is that's very important, that negotiations, and good luck, I guess. Mr. Costello. Mike, along that line, has there, we heard anything from the congressional delegations about delaying the implementation? Because we're not the only city in the country. I mean, there's yeah. thousands of cities. Anybody that's got water next to them is dealing with the same issue. Yeah, we are still waiting to hear back from FEMA on a, um, a specific timeline of when they're going to be asking us to move forward with the, the new maps. But we've also, during those discussions, tried to again, emphasize that we do intend to move forward with the project. Along Greg's questions on the $582 million, that's the value of the structures in the- The new map. The new area. map. Mm -hmm. What, do we have any idea on the value of structures within the city of Sioux Falls? 
it's something to compare that to I, relative. I would have to go back and check that. I think we have that number, but I don't have it with me. Yeah, or, or yeah. Yeah, we can. It seemed like I saw that at a presentation you did for the chamber okay. a while back. Yeah. If you maybe tonight bring it. Okay. Thanks. You have that. Uh, Councilor Knudsen. You know, not. I don't have a question for for Mr. Cooper, but I. Um, I believe it was my I believe it was my very first week on City Council, so that's going to be six and a half years ago that we sat in on a meeting, the councilors who were on the council at that time obviously, on this flood control situation. And I guess it's just a comment, I guess from um, my goodness, I mean of of course our congressional uh, uh, delegation has been involved for years uh, on a regular basis. And then about a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity, I guess I was chair of the council at that time, to sit in on some very informative meetings with FEMA. And um, I just can't imagine that as elected leaders that we can procrastinate much longer on taking care of this massive problem. I just can't believe that we can procrastinate many more hours. Very good. Gene? Uh, just one comment on the valuation. Uh, if you'll check the CAFR, I think the numbers in there were, were uh, coming up or going over $8 billion of tax assessed taxation. But, is, is but that, that's not structures. That's yeah. total taxation. Just give you a sense. We'll get you that number, and I'm sure Mike's got another one. And what would you say it was, Gene? $8 billion? $8 billion. Is Mr. Cotter up now? <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, as you know, in the past, we've, we've provided an overview presentation of the project, and so I'll just do a short look back, give you what the expected bid schedule would be um, at the, what the current schedule is, and also um, Tom Berklin, our project manager, is with us, and so from Public Works, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Essentially, to uh, update the maps to be able to carry the additional flow, it's going to take a series of levee raises, um, building a dam on the Big Sioux River north of the Skunk Creek confluence, as well as raising the 41st Street Bridge. There's a series of steps that a city has to go through to allow for the advancement of funds. The way this original agreement was set up was 75% federal and 25% local. And then that local has been split between 12.5% city and 12.5% state. One of the, when probably the first public meeting that you were able to attend was back in October of 2007 when FEMA came to announce the preliminary maps um, shortly after that, that's when we started to um, try to answer the questions of the residents of how much will I have to pay, what's the, when will these new maps be codified, and how long will the project take. And so in weighing those options and also looking back, knowing that each year we've been getting about $2 million from the federal government to complete the project, it was going to be at least 10 more years to complete the project at that funding stream. Um, considered advancing funds and so at that point a small group of us assisted the mayor and went out to the headquarters of the Corps of Engineers, met with them, asked them if they would support the City of Sioux Falls if we were able to advance the federal share of the project would they pay us back. Um, we've certainly talked that they can't make guarantees. I think there's a there's a couple of key points that they made. They did say that obviously they're committed to the project. It's a budget issue for them, and that's why um, we've only been able to get a certain amount of dollars per year. Um, having said that, too, they've not funded a new project for the last three years. So um, we walked out of there knowing that if we were able to, they're supportive of the project. Um, we understand the risk that they're not obligated to reimburse us, um, but from their standpoint, um, we believe based on the meeting that we had, it's a very good chance that we will be reimbursed. So after that meeting, we know that there's, um, based on the current legal agreement that we have with the Corps, um, that to allow for the advancement of funds, a series of steps had to occur. The majority of those steps have been completed. We have one left, which is updating this 
legal document agreement, which is um, simply an agreement between the Omaha office and the city. That's not um, a schedule uh, significant agreement, not like some of the key signatures that we needed at the headquarters level. Um, building off the presentation that we had, Bill Mulligan and Lewis Upmore come before you back in August to give an overview of the process and the projects. Um, we also had planning and um, finance at that meeting to provide an overview. Um, today where we're at is that obviously tonight is the second reading of the bond ordinance which would address the bridge and the levees as well as the dam for phase two and three. Um, based on the solicitation schedule that we'll hear from Jessica, the earliest on the current schedule to transmit funds to the Army Corps of Engineers would be March 13th um, with an expected bid opening date of the first project which would encompass the phase two levies and the dam. That would occur on April 24th. There's a series of steps um, with uh, evaluating the contracts, awarding contracts, and then issuing a notice to proceed. The earliest notice to proceed on the current schedule would be June 5th. And then that essentially sets into motion two years of levies that need to be raised in the phase two area, as well as the dam. In November of 2009, which is later this year, we'd like to, um, the desired schedule to bid the 41st Street Bridge would be about five months in advance of the um, start of construction. So the materials, the prefabricated pieces, the contracting agreements, the subcontracts, all those um, key steps can occur in that five month period between November and March of 2010. And then last, uh, which should be minor levy raising with, for phase three, which is the diversion channel and levies north of 60th Street, as well as fortifying the dam. So to update the maps, we need to complete the phase two area, which is today is from 49th Street up to Skunk Creek and then west to Marion Road. That, those levies need to be raised, the dam needs to be constructed, and 41st <coughs> Street Bridge needs to be raised before we can work with FEMA to update the floodplain map. And the expectation is if we can stay on schedule and complete the, this amount of work in phase two, and then we'll take um, the majority of 2011 to work with FEMA to update the maps, that's, that's the, essentially the time schedule. Questions, Mark? Councilor Knudsen. Director Cotter, is, um, is there any way that that schedule could even be tightened up more? I think of the incredible horror stories that we all viewed uh, daily about, uh, you know, with our neighbors in Cedar Rapids just mm -hmm. last spring, early summer, whatever the exact months were. I have very good friends there and uh, visited with them regularly about the incredible disaster. And I kept, I mean, I was so sorry it happened there, but I was glad it hadn't happened here. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, I mean, is that, is, uh, I'm sometimes not patient enough with government. Is there any chance that that schedule could even be tightened up more? Well, that's, um, it's already a very aggressive schedule. Um, one of the things that we would hope is that um, with the core uh, administering the work, that the window of time working with FEMA could be shortened um, in updating the maps. And so um, we're very conscious of that and anything that we can take out of the schedule is, um, we'll do. Councilor Costello. Mark, what level of flood protection do we have now? Do we have 20 year, 50 year? Um, let me has uh, Tom Berkland to come up to give you a sense of where, where we're at and what we'll have. Tom? Currently, I, probably the, the 1950s study showed that our present system was a 100 year event. Uh, capable when with the new studies they really haven't looked at what the levels are versus what event will top it uh, there, there's not a very good way to determine 
with the risk and reliability and all these other terms that go into uh, levy certification, there is no other standard besides the 100 year event. So that, that they really haven't given us a specific number of what event these levies can successfully uh, withhold. I had a um, um, constituent that had brought up the fact that some of the engineering is so old on these, on the levy construction, and I, we had talked about it with Mark the other day, and just for the sake of the rest of the council and the people listening, that the engineering is up to date. I mean, a lot of, th we've learned a lot of things about levies in the last 10 years and about some that have worked and quite a few that haven't. And so I, I guess the, the presumption is, is that what we're planning on doing has taken all this new knowledge into it and that um, it's really going to work if it has to. Since uh, Katrina, the knowledge and the standards of levies has gone up tremendously, and that's a very short period of time ago. I, we do get the levies inspected every year. The Corps of Engineers sends representatives up. We look at the whole system, and uh, in the last year, we've taken an even more thorough look at uh, the various parts of the system. And the, the Corps of Engineers is very confident that, that what is there outside of the areas that we're improving uh, is capable of withstanding that flood. Uh, there are some modifications, but uh, overall the, the system is in very good condition. And that what we're going to do is going to impact protect us it, from 100 it has to. They, they have to certify it by today's standards. They can't certify it by previous standards. So what we build will be to the absolute most current standards that, uh, that are there. And uh, Corps of Engineers is pretty much on the leading edge of that. Uh, uh, and they're, they're probably the most authoritative agency on levies. So it, uh, it, I'm very confident that, that what we will get will be as good or as, uh, meeting the standards that are current today. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Staggers. Yes. Um, Mark, uh, why are we bonding the $12 million bridge instead of following the original plan to use tax revenue? Um, well, a number of reasons. I think first and foremost, when we when we're developing the CIP in, in the out years of when it was at, it was it was a project that as it gets closer and we really start to look at what's the best way to uh, balance the CIP. It was my recommendation that we pull it out um, based on the life of the bridge and the life of that asset. Also, I think one of the things we'll potentially talk about is really the timing of how you let that let this type of a bridge. We've been um, working with a consultant on our project on what ways can we accelerate the bridge construction and make sure that um, we've done as much on the front side. So once once we go to e to reconstruct the bridge, um, everything's in place. That takes a period of time prior to the desired time frame. So in backing up from a start date in March <coughs> of 2010, the desired time would be at least five months lead time to bid that project. Well, that's in a different authorization year for the city. That would be, for example, if we want to, if, if we stay on track and bid the 41st Street Bridge in November of 2009, for us to do that out of uh, capital dollars in the CIP, we would have to find that $12 million in our current CIP. Um, the reason that we, uh, we left it in 10 as debt service, there's also a number of projects that truly, from a transportation standpoint, uh, need to be moved up based on their street condition. And I've, I've got a 
I've got a few of them listed out that I can share with you. Um, first and foremost, when we updated and provide almost doubled the funding for the maintenance budget uh, for the streets, when we do that type of work in streets, which is a lot of mill and overlay and asphalt uh, type work, we have a project that we also update all the curb, valley gutters, ADA ramps. That's taken additional dollars um, and and those dollars had to come from somewhere. And so that was one of our first projects that we allocated dollars. When we pulled the bridge out, um, we put $400,000 additional in that project each year to make sure that we can up upgrade all those handicap ramps. Uh, secondly, the downtown street improvements. If you look at A Street from Minnesota Avenue all the way across east through the bridge, um, and even right outside the Chamber's office, the intersection of 8th and Phillips is probably in the worst shape of any intersection in town. Um, I think it's prudent to move that project up to make sure that we can get that pavement to a, a place where it really needs to be and not have it out in 11 where we had it. We were able to move that project from 2011 up to 2010 and also increase the cost to reflect the true cost. That'll be about a $3.2 million project. Uh, River Boulevard is another project that in pulling the bridge out of 2010, we were able to move River Boulevard up from 2011 to 2010. And that will, um, that covers from Cliff Avenue out to 18th Street, and that's about a $3.0 million project. Southeastern Avenue, we were planning to do that project in 2010. We just have some upgraded costs that we needed to provide some additional dollars to. Soberg Avenue overpass in working with the DOT uh, and the coordination of all that work that's underway out in that area. We added an additional $1.5 million to, those, to that project and in turn um, then started to look at debt service for this project in total with the flood control and the bridge of $2.5 million. And so uh, it's essentially a balancing um, point of where, where do we allocate the capital and at what time. And I think two things that we're really facing is that we're, we really truly have a desired bid date of November of 2009 to make sure that we can have a successful and as short of construction period for the 41st Street Bridge as possible. Um, we've got 45,000 commuter, commuters that use that bridge, and so every acceleration uh, method that we can use through that project, we're going to use. And so just simply the authorization year alone um, is probably one of the most <coughs> significant. Secondly is uh, all the other necessary transportation projects that we'll take benefit of and upgrade sooner than later. Okay, so basically we're going to borrow money for this new bridge to move up a, a number of street projects. Yes. But, Nick, well, this year we're spending $170 million on the CIP. Um, I guess I'm wondering, can't we still get $12 million out for the bridge, maybe from really low-priority projects? Um, that's a total number that includes all sure. of... Uh, enterprise funds, and so it's everything. it's much less than that that we would actually be looking at. We're we were just talking about twelve million, though. Out of a hundred, well, like you said, it includes everything. I agree with that, but we still have a lot of money where we could take a look at and saying, well, this this project really is not that important in comparison to the bridge and getting that taken care of, because okay. we're going to be paying interest on the money that we borrow for this bridge too. The, the 170 million is a, is a essentially a, a plan that includes. Uh, you still have uh, Lewis and Clark money left over sure. in there. Uh, <coughs> to find 12 million dollars, we'd be happy to sit with you and have you check off where the where oh, the 12 okay. million dollars is to be found. I'd be more than willing to do that. We we, we uh, this is not something that we take lightly. As as Mark has said, this is priorities that uh, is set um, that's reviewed by the CIP committee. Uh, and to put these in priority order, but uh, I think the the uh, distortion of one hundred and seventy million dollars just doesn't uh, tell you a whole lot about the situation at this point. Well, I guess I wouldn't call it distortion, but uh, I, I would be happy to to get the twelve million. Um, 
for you so we wouldn't have to borrow the money for the bridge. Well, and how much are we going to pay in interest on the bridge? Well, of course, we don't know, but over a 20-year period, what are we going to do? Pay, me, you pay have, you 20 received, million? You received a, a, a proposal, and then Jessica is going to be uh, talking about that momentarily. You received a proposal, you got it last week, that showed the uh, interest payments that uh, goes through this entire project. Yeah, we had a number of different scenarios yes. that was given to us. Yes, yes. and that, that, that is uh, just scenarios. That's nothing carved in stone that will change. Right. I'll guarantee you that uh, because the, the markets will change uh, between now and, and uh, the 1st mm -hmm. of March. And the big thing is going to be, the big question is going to be the, uh, the stimulus package that is put together by the new uh, sure. administration. Councilor Benningham. Questions? Other questions for Mark? Or? Uh, for Mark, please. Mark, can you remind us what the life expectancy of the bridge is? I would expect that the bridge easily, well, first to look back at the one that's there currently. It was constructed in um, the early 60s. I believe it was 1962. It was widened in 1970 and essentially outside of normal maintenance um, hasn't been touched. And so that alone is a 50-year lifespan. Um, you know, I think obviously uh, materials have gotten better and um, quality control practices have, have gotten better and so I would, I would say 50 years is a very conservative uh, lifespan for that bridge. Is it bridge inspected on an annual basis by uh, the state or how does that happen? We have a bri bridge inspection program and Tom also manages that program and so we've got, um, we've got a reoccurring program that m inspects that. I believe, Tom, is that every two years? That all of our bridges are inspected every other year. Every two years, uh, we, uh, we have a list of, I don't know, 30 some bridges that uh, we go through and, and get an inspection report. Uh, the state helps fund that, but uh, the report does come to us. Go ahead. So what, what is the condition of the bridge now? Is it rated? The or? bridge has some problems. The deck uh, is in desperate need of replacement. Structurally, uh, there's, I, I, depending on which terms, which analysis you look at, uh, there, it is structurally deficient. But as far as a, a hazard, uh, it is not going to fall down. Uh, we're not going to have a catastrophic failure of the bridge, uh, but it, it is in need of some, uh, some, it desperately needs a new deck. You can see that when you drive across it. There's, there's holes in the concrete that we've patched. Uh, uh, if you look at the steel underneath, uh, there's, some, there's some problems with that. But uh, so it, it's the deck has definitely uh, lived its life. Councilor Brown. Tom, how does that bridge compare to others in the city in terms of its size, its cost? Is this number one? Is it number five? It, it probably would be number one as far as the, the value, the cost of that mm -hmm. bridge. Um, you, you look at uh, downstream Cliff Avenue bridge uh, by Morell's is probably one of the larger bridges that we have, longer, uh, but it's not as wide. So, uh, but but this one is. It's the most expensive one to replace in the city. Probably. Summer. Okay. Tom is uh, is the reason the primary reason that we are going to replace this bridge besides its aging is the beam depth over the river and the fact that if it, there is flooding, that chunks of ice, trees, uh, other miscellaneous debris could get caught up under there and cause flooding. I uh, basically yes the, we do have to replace the deck we have to raise the bridge for the levy project for the Corps of Engineers to certify it the, the fear is that a flood could actually provide some uplift force on the bridge float it downstream just a little bit cause it to collapse into the river and create a dam which then would <laughs> compromise the levee and, and cause flooding in that area. 
Thank you, Tom. Uh, Councillor Anderson. This question is probably for either yourself or Mark. Um, in replacing the bridge, what plans are we looking at or have we decided on a plan? Are we going to allow traffic or are we going to just completely tear that bridge out and you know, for the shortest amount of time? Um, we've looked at about five different options and we just received our tech memo last week. Um, we're scheduled to meet this week to actually refine that, but um, we have looked at options of full closure and optimum uh, acceleration and also stage construction essentially um, half at a time. And I, our desire will be once we um, get our internal questions answered, and then we'll come and actually do, it's obviously the significance of the project, we'll come and do a presentation for you on what the options were, um, what our recommendation is, and then we'll go to the public as well. Um, but we've got a very good team on it, and um, we also had the opportunity to see an accelerated bridge um, under construction about halfway through it. That was over I-80 in Iowa, uh, in Omaha, in about the last probably four months ago, and it was just ideal timing. We kicked off our um, uh, sourcing of options at that point, and so very soon we'll select and come back to you with what our um, best recommendation will be on um, time, um, how we're going to handle the traffic, um, and then also a recommendation on what the incentive will be to um, per day to beat that schedule. So, Councilor Anderson. Okay, and Eugene, this one's probably for you. Um, with the uh, stimulus package, how is that going to affect the payment of this if we already bonded out? Are we going to be able to pay it off early, or you know, is any of that stimulus money going to be used for a project that we've already started? Well, I think I sent out to the council a statement that came from the Federal Reserve, and, and there was another article that was floating around also, uh, maybe that's the one Mark had, that there was $45 billion uh, marked for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, to, so there's, there's a large sum of money, at least it's being considered there. Uh, the other thing that uh, was of importance is this thing is, is uh, what they call, I guess, shovel ready. I mean, we can hit the, hit, uh, we can be moving dirt by 1st of June, 1st of July, somewhere in that time frame, so it's really early. Uh, and it's a small project in the scheme of things, which uh, might uh, tend to say, let's just pay it off and get it off of our radar so we don't have it there. Um, you know, there's money, there's obviously going to be a lot of money floating around. Uh, whether what this really happens, I don't know, but you know, you've got these, these possibilities that are hanging out there that are, that are good probabilities to, uh, to count on. So to say when, when we're going to get it or how we're going to get it, that we don't know. And when you look at the structure of the, uh, of the proposed bond issue, uh, you know, we'll, you'll see that, that uh, we put as much flexibility into it as we possibly can. We think it's, that's prudent. Uh, because you have these variables all out there that we just really don't have an answer to. Thank you. Gene, did you have a few more speakers then, Gene? Go ahead. Two more? Very good. Uh, Jessica, uh, Jessica Cameron is with PFM out of Minneapolis. There are financial advisors. I'd like to point out that PFM is only in the business of being a financial advisor. They are not a broker. Uh, they, they, get, they get paid their advising fees and that's it. They get nothing out of the sale. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, Jessica's got a few words on this. Before, before that, uh, Gerald, did you have a question? I'll wait. Very good. <coughs> Counselors, I'm Jessica Cameron with PFM. Um, we put forth a couple, I know there were un quite a few numbers in what Jean probably showed you. What we're really looking at doing are a combination of three series of bonds. The first two series would fund the levy portion or the core portion of the project, and then the third series would fund the bridge. The first two series would be a combination of both fixed and floating rate bonds. Um, the purpose behind that is to allow the city the ability to redeem bonds, to take those bonds off your books um, as quickly as you receive payments from the core. And so if the core uh, 
paid $3 million annually over a um, little over eight years. You could redeem bonds right away to get those off your books. It allows for the lowest cost of borrowing. Uh, the bridge portion of the project would be a 20-year fixed term under the current service scenario that we're looking at. This is, of course, flexible. Um, the idea behind it is that you know, going forward, if by, you know, we'll have numbers finalized by mid to late February to get that money available by mid-March. If the stimulus package goes through um, and we find out about that in mid-February, we can adjust the amounts that are being issued under the various series to uh, make sure that you are able to redeem bonds immediately upon receiving core proceeds. Councilor Knudsen. Um, Jessica, one, um, one step I just missed there is, is the, the, um, the bridge um, bond would, um, help me again, I just got confused. Um, um, why is that important that that be a different bond um, strategy than the other, just because I was wondering if there was, since to me, you know, we wouldn't be replacing that bridge if we didn't have to for floodplain reasons at this point, I don't think, uh, is that, yeah, um, so it's very logical that it all fits together, um, in one package for me, and so if in fact the federal government would repay um, that part of, um, of, I of its share for the um, bridge um, replacement also is um, why does the bridge part have to be in a separate bond? Uh, currently, from what I understand, um, given letters, and, uh, I would expect that Jean or Mark could speak to this, given letters and understanding with the Corps of Engineers, they have actually specified a specific dollar amount that oh. they are planning to fund for the project. Okay. Yeah, I can Sorry. answer that question. The Corps of Engineers does not have any funding for the bridge. That is our cost for the project. Uh, federal funds cannot be used or accredited uh, for that. that. That's a local sponsor's, um, uh, part of the local sponsor's funding for the project. So we, we will not get reimbursed for the bridge portion. Thank you. I assumed it was something like that that I was missing. So thank you both. Councilor Costello. Can you um, speak to, we're gonna potentially sell these bonds in March, was it, or April? March. Or March. Um, the economic environment and how that figures into this, selling bonds in that time frame. Uh, right I mean, now I was. Is it I mean, compared to maybe like how, what we did with Lewis and Clark, last year I mean what what's changed how is this gonna work markets are much more volatile than they were I would say a year ago uh, rates have uh, the movement in rates on the short end of the curve so within the first five to ten years rates have actually gone down pretty significantly and then rates on the longer end of the curve have trended upwards overall um, on a 20-year basis, the cost of borrowing today is not significantly different from a year ago. Um, that being said, we have seen significant movement in market, in the market sort of over the past three months, but it's sort of been within a range. After you had the first initial market, um, market movement that occurred in mid-September, I would say where we saw rates just kind of shoot way up. Rates have begun to come back down. Um, in fact, since we ran numbers mid last month, rates have actually come down about 25 basis points or a quarter of a percent across most of the curve. What has really become important in the current market um, is credit. And the city is well primed since it is at a double A um, and has a double A3 rating from Moody's. That rating has become much more important. The difference between rates at a double A level and a single A level are almost a full percent. So there's still a, an active bond market that um, there, sales go on all the time, even during the economic crisis. 
there is a very active bond market, especially for high-grade credits like the city. Um, I did six bond sales in December alone, and then um, we're in the process of pricing another one this week. Councilor Steggers. Yes, uh, I was just wondering, uh, as our f uh, financial advisor, were you involved in uh, determining that we would have 12% uh, in the ordinance as a max for interest? The 12% rate? Yes. I believe the 12% rate, I did not come up with the actual 12% figure. Uh -huh. um, I believe a portion of it is to allow for variable rate, for the variable rate debt. Because typically, variable rate bonds have a very, very low rate. Um, but within the documents that you set up, you have to allow for a maximum rate and not to exceed rate. And that's usually set at 10 to 12 percent. The reason being, not because you would ever expect to see that, see those bonds hit that rate, but because it's viewed as a... Um, provides comfort? Well, it, provide, it not only provides comfort to bondholders, but there's also a concern on the, from the bank's perspective. You have to have a liquidity provider for this. It, it basically is needed to provide comfort in the market and assure that you're getting the best possible rates on a variable rate transaction. Mm -hmm. On the bridge, since it's going to be fixed, uh, can you, I know it's hard to predict the future, but in a few months, uh, what would you think we might be paying for an interest rate on, a, on that bridge for $12 million? I mean, based upon current rates and the fact that rates have come down a little bit, I would expect it to be under 5%. Under 5%? Yes. And I don't know if you have the chart or table or whatever, but over a 20-year period, how much would that be in interest? Uh, that would be probably around $8 million in Eight interest, million. Okay. assuming a couple of things. One, that over the course of that 20 years, there was never an opportunity to refund that debt mm -hmm. for savings, which I would say most fixed-rate transactions do get refunded for savings over the term. Uh, additionally, that does not include any um, debt service reserve fund earnings and some of the other things that can offset those costs. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Jameson, and I'd just like to preface uh, your comments with, uh, you know, we had, do have uh, one more presenter here and then a meeting afterwards. I don't want to cut you short, Greg, but... <coughs> this might sound a little odd, but... Jessica, tell us again why, as, as our financial advisor, tell us why you're advising us that we should borrow this money. I mean, tell us why, uh, what gives you the uh, credentials to tell us this information? I mean, what makes you so smart? <laughs> um, well, I do work in a firm. We are the largest financial advisor in the nation. We uh, were ranked number one again for 2008. Um, and that includes negotiated transactions, competitive transactions, small issues sort of across the board. Uh, typically, the reason people bond and the idea behind bonding is that you are, one, spreading the costs of that borrowing, of that project over the constituents, constituency who will enjoy it. The reality is if you pay for everything up front today, it's your current taxpayers and it's your current constituents who are going to be paying for that today. They may not be here 20 years from now. They may not be here five years from now. Their life may have changed quite a bit in that period of time. And so your constituents are paying for the infrastructure that they enjoy through bonding. Now, I would never suggest that you bond for every project. Um, you also look at the reasonable life of that project. Uh, you do not want your borrowing to exceed what the life of that project would be. We're looking at 20 years on the bridge. 
that's significantly shorter than a 50 year time, the time span that Mark was talking about. Um, one other thing that I would point out, and it's something that a lot of people can relate to is mortgages on your home. I personally did not buy my home outright. I have a mortgage on my home. The idea being <coughs> that the value of that home, that I'm not going to rent until I can save up enough money to buy a house because it's always a losing battle. And if you saved up funds to build every project, the cost of that project increases um, over time. I mean, inflation rates far exceed what your borrowing rates are, especially on a tax exempt basis. Other questions? Councillor Costello. You know, I agree with a lot of what you just said, but it, the thought just <coughs> occurs to me that. Um, to my understanding, this is the first time in the city's history that we're going to bond for an arterial street project like this. And if I'm wrong, somebody can correct me. So this is a monumental shift in philosophical thought on how we're going to fund for infrastructures for the city of Sioux Falls. I mean, I, I don't think anybody should lose sight of that fact. This is completely different than what we have ever done before. What you said got merit. But today I drive on infrastructure that my parents bought years ago. And it's, it's an evolution. It's just the way we've done things in this city. So to bond now for this road, for this bridge, is completely different than what we have ever done in the city in the past. Well, in regards to that, Mr. Costello, I'd like to comment that I think this bridge is an anomaly. It's uh, in the circumstance that we are paying for it in are, are is also an anomaly because we've never had this situation exactly like this before. And I think. Uh, I think this is a special bridge, it's a special project, and you serve some special attention on which way we go. I really haven't made my mind up either, but I, I just would have well, to relate those comments to you. It was, it was a special project in 2008, and it was paid for out of our second penny sales tax. Uh, is, is, Mark, is this the biggest project we, we, we've done in public works on a, on a single? I'd certainly say the characteristics of that is the the length. The uh, it's certainly there's a lot of capital that goes into a bridge of this nature, and also just trying to balance all that traffic during the construction. Um, and again, under also we've we've got a bidding window here that we're trying to move up through an appropriation year ahead of where it used to be funded. It, um, the previous CIP, it was in 10, and for us to keep it in the year 10, we'd have to wait till January 1st to bid, um, which would essentially delay the construction, not in March. It would be probably a June start, and then we just get further into the fall. Um, and so there's a number of reasons that this was switched to bond funds. But the 10 to $12 million is one of the bigger projects that we've done in one That's time. right, that's right. Okay. Mark, on, on that line, so she had mentioned that uh, um, construction cost inflation goes up probably higher than um, you know, our interest rate. On the levy project, what's the city's risk on inflation? Um, are you asking what that what that type of construction normally does? Because every type of construction has a different inflationary rate. But are you specifically saying what is earthwork right. um, I mean, inflationary? If, it, if, it, if the levy is going to cost us $24 million today, what's the levy going to cost the city tomorrow? 26? Because um, I would argue, I would argue that the levy portion isn't costing the city anything that it's the federal government's responsibility to build the levy. And they bear the inflationary cost. Well, there's, I think we came back to that, though. The reason that the city is recommending to advance the <coughs> funds is with the impending FEMA maps. And that now they're, um, the preliminary number that Mike Cooper shared with what people will pay in insurance premiums um, in the new FEMA floodplain also is a, is a very high number. It so is. So it's balancing those It factors. is a very high number. But the reality is that the city of Sioux Falls didn't put anybody in a floodplain. Right? The map is certainly um, administered by the FEMA. 
Councilor Brown. The trouble is that the feds might bear that cost, but the city bears all the risk if that flood ever happens. Waiting isn't an option. Very good. Gene, I understand that you have, uh, is there any other questions? Oh, yes. Very good, Gene. You have one more presenter down from the land of the hapless Minnesota Vikings. <coughs> <laughs> I think I told some of you, I told my son last night after that game, he, he lives up in, in Minneapolis and he's something of a Vikings fan and I told him he ought to go out in his front yard and make a nice pile and burn it right there of all of his Vikings material. <laughs> uh, our, our final person is Betsy Abbey. Betsy's uh, worked with the city of Sioux Falls for a lot of years on a lot of different projects. She's a, a skilled bond council, uh, particularly skilled with uh, municipal type activities. So, and Betsy will explain a little bit about the actual bond structure and, and some of the ins and outs of that, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about it. Mayor and city council, um, I think you all have a copy of the ordinance. Um, that's been proposed and it allows one or more bond issues um, under this ordinance so that they can be structured for how it works best for this project. Um, it pledges the second penny sales tax for this project just like all the other bonds, bond issues that have been issued since 1988. This is a master indenture with many bond issues outstanding today, including 164 million that, um, that's outstanding um, under this bond indenture, not including this issue. Um, the covenants were essentially negotiated back in 1988 and they stand today. Um, it's a contract between all the bondholders for the 165 million in bonds that are outstanding. We add to it, we add new projects. It's the same, it's, it's the same indenture for Lewis and Clark. Um, and things like public safety, park and library, you know, Lewis and Clark, and lots of water projects. Um, it allows for more than one bond issue so that you can, um, schedule things differently based on when the federal government pays you back. So there's flexibility there. The 12% was my, my rate. And I've seen them mo most commonly lately at 10%, but I don't know what banks are negotiating as a maximum rate. And if it is a variable rate issue, the bank is the one that decides what the max rate is. So if we put in 10 and the bank that um, charged the least and, and best, fav best terms said, I want a max rate of 12, we'd have to come back. That's why the 12, my choice. <coughs> I've been seeing 10, but I've also been seeing 12. But the bond market is kind of shaky and banks are getting a little nuts. What could I answer for you? Questions of Betsy. Dr. Staggers. Yes. Um, we have a uh, citizen initiative that began in uh, October to reduce the uh, sales tax here in Sioux Falls, the second penny. Um, and the question has been raised about um, if the initiative can continue because of this uh, bond issue. And so a number of us are, are just wondering uh, what is your uh, legal opinion on that because of South Dakota Constitution, South Dakota law? South Dakota Constitution um, doesn't allow a city or municipality that's entered into a contract to pay debt to reduce their obligation. The city has pledged on its outstanding $164 million of bonds, the sales tax bonds is what I'll call them, 0.92% of the second penny. You would be violating Article 13, Chapter 5 of the South Dakota Constitution. You'd be violating um, South Dakota statutes 1052-2.10 as well as breaching your contract with all the bondholders. 
the easy possibility would be just that the bond trustee would sue you and that you would have to come up with $164 million to pay off the bonds instantaneously. Okay, now, um, in effect then, uh, with your interpretation of this, that there is no way that citizens in South Dakota, no matter where they live, if, if a government entity has uh, bonded and has pledged some tax revenue, no matter how small it is or whatever the case might be, that citizens cannot have an initiative to reduce a, a tax. Is that fair to say or not? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. If you've made a contract with $164 million worth of bonds that says you will keep this tax effective until the bonds are repaid, and you want to violate that with all those people, I think that would be a hard stretch. In addition, if you look at the South Dakota Constitution, it's a violation by saying that, as I read, any city, town, county, school district, or other subdivision incurring indebtedness shall at or before the time of doing so provide for the collection of an annual tax sufficient to pay the interest and also the principal thereof when due and all laws and ordinances providing for the payment of principal and interest of any debt shall be irrepealable until such debt is paid. Mm -hmm. That's one. Mm -hmm. The sales tax statute in the middle of it says the governing body can also pledge so much of its collection of taxes as may, may be necessary to pay the principal and premium and interest on the bonds and to maintain any debt service. It also says that the governing body, the city of Sioux Falls, which has done this <coughs> in the past since 1988, will agree to continue to impose and collect the taxes so long as the bonds are outstanding. In addition, in the indenture and in every bond that's been issued under this for the city of Sioux Falls since 1988, it says the city will continue to collect those taxes to pay the principal interest on the bonds. Councilor Costello. If I could just clarify something else here. Um, just to clarify. Um, so this initiative that uh, is being circulated right now would reduce the um, second penny by about $5 million and uh, would not have any impact on this, this bond issue. You're, you're, you're also still saying that even though it really would not have an impact. I didn't say that there would be no impact. No, no, I'm, I'm saying the $5 million reduction in the sales tax is not going to prevent the city from paying off these bonds. It's irrelevant whether oh, you that's, that's what I'm trying to find out, yes. It's okay. irrelevant. Okay. You've pledged to collect this ta tax to pay off these bonds. Okay. Councilor Costello. Okay. Um, you had said that we've, we're pledging 92 one hundredths, and we recently raised to a full penny. Yes. Why are we not pledging a full penny? Uh, in this resolution, you do. In the past, okay. all the issues prior to this year, because this, this tax just became effective January 1st, 2009. So before 2009, um, it was 0.92. So you're, okay, so you're, you're saying that if we, if, if, so this initiative really isn't even possible uh, in relation to all the bonds we sold, sold before, and not necessarily this one we're talking about. Well, this one, you couldn't issue under this indenture. Well, couldn't, I, I mean, I thought the easy solution to that is only pledge nine-tenths of it. Yeah. Instead of 92. No, you can't do that because these bonds all of the bonds are on a parity with each other. In essence, by saying on a parity means that one defaults, they all default. They've got a common security, and one of the, one of the wonderful things that the city gets out of pledging all their sales tax, second penny, for all these bond issues is they're all got this huge credit, and they've got this huge coverage ratio. So everybody gets the benefit of it. So you're not piecing out a slice here for this person and a slice here for this person and a slice here for everybody gets that huge pot and they know it's enough. And so the rating agencies come and say, Sioux Falls, 
you've budgeted well, you know what you're doing, and you've got coverage that's plenty, even if the sales tax goes down. And so they're giving you the benefit of this big pool as opposed to a slice. If you gave somebody just a teeny revenue source of the water collections in a district, you wouldn't be doing, or the sales tax in that, in that district. By leveling the whole city together, you're not giving an area that's not doing well economically an advantage over somebody else. You're treating them the same. So and so that's what you're doing with the bondholders. You're treating them the same. So then do the um, you know, bondholders that came before the next issue, do they have, if something They're all on a parity. So Everybody's on a parity. Everybody is together in the boat. So they're, they're really at the mercy of what happens after they sell the bond. I mean, what happens on future bonds? Because the more bonds we, we take on, Yes, to a limit, because the initial bond indenture said you couldn't do more bonds than I think it's 1.5, you know, coverage, or 1.75. And in addition to that, the city has its own resolution saying that it's not going to do anything if there was less than 2 -0 coverage. So, so that's why I don't look at, okay. the, at the bond indenture, because you have a more restrictive so limit here. At the end of the day, what happens if the citizens turn in enough signatures for their initiative? Um, I think the initiative uh, should probably have problems because um, it would be a violation of your existing contracts, a and, violation of state law. And not a violation of all the other bonds we sold, not just this particular Absolutely. Tonight. Every, that I would expect that, knock knock, the trustee for all the bondholders who's the would be saying you're violating the covenants. And even though it isn't a payment default, meaning you're not, not paying on the bonds, um, it's a default because you violated the contract. Other questions of Betsy? Very good. Have you any more information for us? I don't think then so. Then we'll probably see you later tonight. Thank you. Okay, I guess that concludes uh, our little portion of it. Uh, um, if you have any questions on that, uh, you know, feel free to tackle one of us and ask us. Uh, we'll try and answer it for you. Uh, <coughs> we think we've come up with a good solution. We've got good people that have worked on it. Uh, they've done this kind of thing before, and uh, they'll, they'll be doing it in the future. And, and like I say, I think we've got a pretty good solution to solving the, uh, uh, the issue. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Gene. Okay, I'm, uh, now I'm going to be looking for a motion to adjourn into executive session for a personnel oh, issue. I, I've got one quick uh, comment to make. Would it be possible if we could deal with the bond issue right up front at the meeting? Because I know there's some people that want to speak about that. Any objections? It's, on, it's number 17. It's I guess I got a little bit of a problem with that because we've had all these people who want to do all these rezonings. They've known for months and months and months that they're going to be here. And why should we give them prior? I mean, it just doesn't make sense to push them way to the back of the, the agenda because we have a few people who want to speak about the bond uh, yeah, initiative. This was calendared with a public notice. People know when it's supposed to be done. And I think to keep moving people in front of everybody all the time just because of one group is not fair to the people who have gone through the system and have been calendared the way they're supposed to be calendared. Well, I guess if I could respond to that, uh, we haven't had that uh, concern expressed in the past, and uh, I guess I'm wondering why we're having this concern expressed right now. Very simple. We didn't have 29 items that it's going to take us hours and hours to go through and to, to put them in the front I don't think is necessarily fair to the other 28 people, frankly. I would just like to note that the first uh, 16 items, I think, are consent agenda. So Correct. We're really, you're talking about, you know, eight items. <coughs> Shouldn't be any problem. Any appetite for it or stand pat? Councilor Anderson? I think we can stay pat. Councilor Jameson? Not a question, we'll leave it either way. Councilor Costello? I think we leave it as is. 
Uh, I'd like to leave it as it is, Mr. Brown. Leave it as it is. Okay, there we have it. Sorry, Mr. Staggers. Okay, well, I mean, I guess it's the first time we've uh, rejected something like this. Maybe this will be a precedent. Who Maybe. Knows? Good. Could be. Very but good. I'm it. still looking for a motion to adjourn into executive session. So moved. So moved by Costello. Good. a second? Second. Second with Jameson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. <laughs>